This is a mechanism of disease map on subarachnoid hemorrhages. This is one type of hemorrhagic stroke that you can differentiate from ischemic strokes. In subarachnoid hemorrhages, the definition is that you're bleeding into the subarachnoid space. And we'll be discussing the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of these. As in all of these flowcharts, each of these boxes is color-coded according to the legend that you see on the top right. And I'll be clearing each of these bubbles and going through them and discussing them one by one. So again, I mentioned the definition, which kind of makes sense, is that you have bleeding into the subarachnoid space. And this usually happens when you have rupture of some type of structural problem. Usually it's an aneurysm or an arteriovenous malformation. Now the intracranial aneurysms are usually berry aneurysms and that makes up 80% of non uh, of non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhages. They're usually in the circle of Willis, especially in the anterior circulation of the circle of Willis. Now, arteriovenous malformations can also cause subarachnoid hemorrhages, but they're also associated with intracerebral hemorrhages. These are distinct. This is um, bleeding into the brain parenchyma as opposed to bleeding into the subarachnoid space. And they're both types of hemorrhagic stroke, but intracerebral hemorrhage is not what we're talking about here. There will be another video on that. Now, there are a number of um, risk factors and other causes of subarachnoid hemorrhages, so let's get into those. First, we can break down the triggers of subarachnoid hemorrhage into non-spontaneous and spontaneous. Non-spontaneous essentially refers to trauma. You have a mechanical force that's transmitted to the brain and you have a traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage that causes rupture of an aneurysm or an arteriovenous malformation. In spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage, something causes an acute increase in blood pressure. These are some examples. Caffeine consumption, um, of course, is a drug that can increase your blood pressure, can make you anxious and increase your blood pressure. Fits of anger can make you anxious, can uh, increase your blood pressure, can affect your hormones that increase your blood pressure. And physical exertion. If all of a sudden you get up and you're out of shape and you start moving, you might have a really sudden, quick increase in blood pressure. Your body might not be able to compensate and that might trigger rupture of an aneurysm or an arteriovenous malformation. There are other risk factors as well. These are listed here. Hypertension, that's chronic hypertension. Smoking puts you at risk. High alcohol consumption. Remember that alcohol ruins your blood vessels in many ways, um, and one of them is predisposing you to subarachnoid hemorrhages. Positive family history predisposes you to having a subarachnoid hemorrhage yourself. Some drugs that also increase your blood pressure generally uppers, like methamphetamines and cocaine, and having a large aneurysm, of course, predisposes you to rupture compared to a smaller aneurysm. Now, it's not always intracranial aneurysms and arteriovenous malformations that cause the bleed. There are other causes. These are less common. They include angioma. That's a brain tumor. Other neoplasms in the brain. These generally just have structural differences in their vasculature that predispose them to bleeding. Cortical thrombosis can, of course, cause bleeding. This changes the flow of uh, blood going into your brain. It can cause a backup of blood behind the thrombosis, or it can cause a lack of blood and negative pressure in front of the thrombosis, both of which can break vessels and lead to bleeding. And lastly, infections can cause um, vascular problems that lead to bleeding. Now let's talk about the manifestations of subarachnoid hemorrhage. The classic symptom is the thunderclap headache. This is a severe, sudden headache. It's sometimes described as the worst headache of my life. It's hollow cephalic, which means it affects the entire head all the way around, and it radiates to the neck and to the back. We also have some other symptoms from subarachnoid hemorrhage, and we can kind of break down how these are caused from the blood itself. So the blood products in the central nervous system are broken down. That's what the body does when there's blood in a place it's not supposed to be in. Just like if you were to have a bruise, it would change colors as your body breaks down the blood and reabsorbs its products. The same thing happens in the subarachnoid space. The problem is that these blood products, they cause irritation to the meninges. So you can have meningeal signs as you're breaking down the blood in the subarachnoid space.
The classic meningeal sign is nuchal rigidity. Your neck is stiff and it's painful to move your neck. And I'll be placing the symptoms here um, in a specific order because we'll be ranking them according to a classification system. So uh, be patient with me as we go through these. So meningeal signs, they include nuchal rigidity. Other meningeal signs include photophobia, nausea, vomiting, as well as these physical exam signs, the Koenig and the Brodzinski signs. These are essentially associated with stretching your meninges. For instance, if the patient is on their back and they extend their hip but bend their knee, that might cause their neck to hurt. Or if you have them uh, lift their neck, if you have them flex the neck when they're laying on their back, they might have a reflex in, um, in extending their knee to kind of relax that meningeal space. It's worth looking up pictures or videos of these signs to see how people with meningeal irritation might react between their hip, their knee, and their neck movements. Next, the blood in the subarachnoid space can also cause a mass effect. This has a number of downstream mechanisms. It can first cause a focal neurologic deficit. So this can range from a mild cranial nerve palsy to a mild focal neurologic deficit where they can't move an arm or a leg or total hemiparesis, depending on how much blood and how much mass effect you have. They can also have cerebrate posturing. This is typically a more severe sign and it can also range from mild to severe but in any case any kind of cerebral or cerebrate posturing um, is very concerning lastly it can cause varying degrades of uh, altered mental status so in mild cases the patient might have confusion it can also be stupor in more severe cases uh, vegetative disturbances and in more severe cases it can be a profound coma all caused by this mass effect Lastly, the mass effect of the blood also irritates the brain parenchyma itself, and that can lead to seizures in subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, I mentioned this classification system that we use to kind of grade the severity of subarachnoid hemorrhages, and let's fill in the remaining symptoms and criteria here. So one is the least severe subarachnoid hemorrhage that can be asymptomatic or with a mild headache, plus minus some nuchal rigidity, and you can work your way all the way down to the most severe, grade five, which includes decerebrate posturing and profound coma. Now another type of presentation of subarachnoid hemorrhage, and this happens in like 30 to 50% of patients that have these, are when you have these warning signs. These typically last, or these typically occur weeks to days before the main severe thunderclap headache. The patient will have low grade warning leakage of blood into the subarachnoid space, and they present with milder transient symptoms. So as I mentioned, these are prodromal symptoms days to weeks before the actual event itself. And another type of symptom you might have is just transient diplopia, transient double vision. Um, that kind of comes and goes as that blood leaks a small amount into the subarachnoid space before the main event, before the thunderclap headache. Lastly, a quick word on diagnostics for subarachnoid hemorrhage. The first test you want to do is a head CT without contrast. This will allow you to see a hyperdensity in the subarachnoid space. That hyperdensity is the blood itself, which appears as very dense in the brain and it shouldn't be there. And you sometimes see it in the cerebral sulci. Once you've confirmed a subarachnoid hemorrhage, you then need to uh, choose another diagnostic step um, and that can include a CT angiography. If it was a spontaneous, non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, this might allow you to see the intracranial aneurysm or the arteriovenous malformation that burst and broke and caused the subarachnoid hemorrhage. If you're unsure about the CT scan, you can also do a lumbar puncture. This will allow you to sample the uh, cerebral spinal fluid and you can look for blood or blood products that way as well. I hope this video on subarachnoid hemorrhage was helpful and uh, we'll have another one on intracerebral hemorrhage and another on ischemic stroke as well. Thank you for listening.